Hello and welcome to the Global Dialogue, an initiative by CSCA Direct. On the show today, we have with us a very special guest, Mark Faber. Mark, thanks a ton for joining us today. Uh, Mark, I want to start by talking to you about the global economy. Life uh, post-COVID is very different and the impact of COVID is also very different for different countries. Uh, most countries in the West are seeing a sharp recovery in terms of global markets, global economy. Where do you really see this global economy go in 2021 and where is value really emerging uh, with regard to a sharp economic recovery? Well, uh, I'd just like to say that when you talk about the economy, you're talking about different sectors of the economy and different income groups. So it is true that stock markets, in most cases, uh, not so much in emerging markets, but otherwise, they have made very strong recovery moves and some are at new highs. That is correct. On the other hand, if you walk out on the street in Mumbai, you will see how miserable poor people are living. This is the reality of money printing. By money printing, the central banks have favored wealthy people, including myself. I myself are saying all the time in my prayers that our Lord has to look after poor people and not after us, because we, wealthy people, financial people, haven't suffered at all. It's much more convenient for me to give a conference or an interview through Zoom than to go to a studio. This way I can have a drink. Well, tonight I'm only drinking tea. (laughs) That is a different story. But uh, basically, we have to distinguish. In America, there are far fewer people employed than there were before the COVID crisis. And a lot of these people will not go back to work or they cannot, or they have occupations that paid them very little. And in the meantime, the say 10, 20, 30 richest Americans, they have added not billions, trillions of dollars to their wealth. So it's very uneven and different sectors have also reacted differently. As you know, the tourist industry has suffered very badly. You only need to go into a hotel and you can see how many people and visitors from overseas they are. Even if they have a vaccine, they don't want to travel for different reasons and so forth. So I think that uh, to say that everything is fine and better than before is a gross exaggeration. I think uh, this crisis will go linger on. So on the economy, I'm not wildly bullish. If you ask me about the stock market, I think, well, central banks will continue to print money and maybe stocks will make new highs. But as you know, how do we measure a new high? In money terms, but if money depreciates against bitcoins and other cryptocurrencies and against silver, gold and platinum, uh, what is the value of a new high? You understand, it's very difficult to determine Are we making any progress in real terms or not? And I have to say that for many people, I can see it here in Thailand because I live in the north of Thailand. For many people, life is atrocious at the moment. They have no income. Uh, 25% of the economy here was tourism. All these people that worked in hotels, in bars, in restaurants, in coffee shops, They lost their jobs. And it's not like in America, France, and England, where the government then pays uh, from money that they printed. (laughs) You understand? Nothing, as Milton Friedman says, there's no free lunch. Someone will have to pay the bill for all this. And sadly, it is the countries, uh, maybe like India and Thailand, that are paying the bills. But uh, let's just break this down, Mark. Uh, The financial markets are obviously not a reflection of what's happening on the macros or the economy. 
Uh, it is a function of $3 trillion of liquidity that's making its way into these financial markets. How long then do you anticipate this party to continue? Because reality of the economies has to catch up, I would imagine, right? Yes, but you have to see one thing. When you print money, as we do now, at certain times, the printed money goes into corporate profits. Okay, yeah. And during that time, obviously, you can say that fundamentals are improving because earnings are going up. But why are earnings going up? Because you're printing money. I think we have to wait and see because, as you know, in the 1970s, we had accelerating inflation and interest rates in America, I'm measuring now on the 10 years treasury, went in 1970 from 6% to 15.84% in 1981. So we had a steady rise in interest rates. And because inflation was accelerating, uh, corporate profits disappointed because there was a margin squeeze on, right. on the profitability of companies. And more recently, as you know, prices have been going up a lot less wages but uh, prices have been going up a lot for food and uh, for cars and uh, used cars in the united states and rents are going up although the buildings may be half empty but the rents go up and the price of a house goes up so young people can't afford them uh, so we have a very distorted economy where essentially asset prices go up but for the majority of people, the salary recipients, the real earnings, what they earn, take home after they spend, uh, they, after they paid taxes in the first place, but after they spend on life necessities like health care, education, food, rents, and so forth, that is all going up. So it's squeezing their real incomes. So that's why I'm not so sure that the economy will be very strong in the next 12 months. I think we had a very strong recovery after April 2020, because we fell very hard on the economy. We also fell very hard in the stock market. That recovery bounce, I think, is pretty much over. And now the economic figures will probably be rather disappoint. So I'm not so sure that we will go up a lot from here. Okay. Right. Mark, do you have any exposure to the Indian markets? Uh, mostly in fixed interest securities, in bonds. Okay. And what is the outlook uh, on the bond market in India, A and B? Uh, would you be looking to allocating any capital to the equity markets uh, if you do see a correction? Yes, if I see a correction, for sure. But you, you, you understand this leads us to the next question. <laughs> uh, the markets, you look at the index. Right. Uh, the index is at a new all-time high. Yeah. So uh, in Europe. But there are lots of stocks. They're still down 70% from the 2007 high. And some stocks are down 70% from the 1998 high. In other words, uh, we look at markets. Some markets are at a new high, like India. And some markets haven't moved at all, like Hong Kong. Still very inexpensive. Now someone will say, well, the fundamentals are bad in Hong Kong and so forth. This is one perspective. I can also highlight another perspective where I say, the fundamentals are actually quite good or say better than what investors expect. Ditto for Singapore or for Indonesia. Why is India at a new high and Indonesia doesn't move and moves down? You understand? So yes. there are some stocks in the world that actually sell at the 50% discount to their asset value. 
and other stocks they sell at 20 times uh, their book value or they don't even have a book value. <laughs> you understand? So we have a dual market and I think the investor uh, is probably going to have to kind of focus on value stocks in future. Like in the Indian market, there are some companies that are inexpensive, but some companies are very expensive and so forth. So <coughs> my sense is it's a very interesting environment where index funds will not do very well. Right. But okay. individual stock pickers, they are selecting uh, selected companies within the market. They can do well. I'm glad you bring that up because the last year saw index funds do exceptionally well. And uh, if you just bought yes. the index, yes. you have some, seen some serious outperformance. Uh, but if you couldn't talk about it being a value stock pickers market, what are those sectors? What are those stocks that you're watching on your radar and thinking, uh, the minute I see another correction here, these are the counters I'm going after in India? Well, it, in India, it may be similar, but I can tell you that, say, in the US and in Asia outside India, anything to do with real estate is actually relatively, I'm speaking, relatively depressed. Uh, financial stocks have been depressed, but now in the first six months of this year, for first five months, say the S&P uh, financial stock index is up 30%. It's the best performing index. But you understand, you fell from 100 to 10. Now yes. you're up 30%, so from 10 to 13. So you're still low but you're not as low as before. So a correction will come to these stocks. It's like also real estate investment trust <laughs> in Asia, they're very cheap. I mean, we have in the world, okay, in India, what are short-term interest rates, 6% or so? Uh, so you have a relatively high yield in India, but around the world, if I, buy a portfolio of European bonds, my yield is going to be zero. Some bonds are negative interest rates, like German bonds, Swiss bonds, French, Dutch, uh, and some bonds have a small interest, but say it's an anomaly that Portuguese bond yields are lower than in the United States. It means Portugal has a higher quality okay. uh, credit uh, quality than the US. Yeah. So you have these distortions because the central banks always maintain, oh, we are stabilizing market. No, they're not. They're manipulating markets. Completely agree with you, Mark. Whereby I always say, one of the best behaved central banks is the Bank of India, among all the central banks. And hence you like the debt markets in India or the equity markets? Well, I own mostly dollar bonds of uh, Indian companies. So you're not very fond of taking on currency exposure then, right? Well, the, you know, if you own bonds, of a company and the company's uh, earnings are going up and its quality is improving. In other words, the stock price goes up, bond prices will also go up. So what companies are these, Mark? Or what sectors are these that you uh, like? Infrastructure, okay. airports, banks. And these, and when you say banks, do you mean PSU banks, private sector banks? What is your flavor? Uh, I think both are relatively inexpensive. Okay, so financials, infrastructure, yes. airports, financial. anything in the cyclical space, uh, what about sectors like IT, pharma, because they've been resilient and have outperformed after decades of underperformance. Uh, I don't have uh, IT in India. What about pharmaceutical companies? I in have the international ones, but not in India. 
Right. So India largely is a but domestic... You understand. You don't look at me as an example of an investor that focuses on India. Yeah, you're I more global. focus on the whole world. So how does and, uh, and how does India stack up against its peers? Of course, uh, you did say Hong Kong, Singapore are currently offering far more value than India, right? Yes, other markets are far cheaper. You know, I can buy Iraqi stocks. I can buy Uzbekistan stocks. Yeah, but you're going to be they paying sell at five times earnings. Right. The best companies at five times earnings. So, okay, so, let's, let's move away from uh, equity markets and talk to me about commodities. Uh, I remember in the start, la second half of last year, you were quite optimistic and go on gold. Uh, gold and silver managed to do quite well in the first uh, few months of this year. Are you expecting gold, silver to continue to rally up? Uh, I know they've corrected very sharply, of course. Well, I'm actually happy with the price of gold because it hasn't gone up a lot. Yeah. Still uh, when you look today at the financial market, what is moving, say, uh, around the world. Cryptocurrencies, yeah. very volatile, but they've gone up a lot since the beginning of the year. Do you think they'll and go up more? You, you have a lot of speculation in Bitcoins and Ethereums and every, Dogecoin and so forth. And then you have a lot of speculation in so-called meme stocks. <laughs> the meme <laughs> stocks. And uh, the Reddit crowd, you know, people that look at websites and so forth, and then they all pile in into a stock, and then it goes up a lot, like GameStop or AMC and so forth. And the, if you look at the, everybody says we are in a bubble stage. Yes, for many assets, we are in a bubble, but we are not in a bubble for gold, silver, and platinum, there's no interest. If you go to people and say, you have to buy today gold, they yawn, they're not interested. But if you go today and say someone to someone, well, you have to get buy GameStop or some SPACs or COS or AMC or whatever speculative there is, whatever is impossible to value, people will buy. You're right. What they can value, there's no interest. So th that's what I'm saying. The market, when people say that we are in a bubble, some sectors are in a bubble, but not every sector. So fair to assume that you're still bullish on gold, silver, and platinum? I am always bullish on gold, silver, and platinum as long as we have central banks in the world. Wow. The central banks will guarantee that precious metals go up in the long run because central bankers are destructors, uh, terminators of the value of paper money. Yes, terminators. Right. You I mentioned wanna... paper money, and that brings me to my next question. Now, what about crypto? You brought that up a bunch of times in our conversation, but... Uh, what are you doing? Are you trading crypto? Can this go Yes, in? sometimes I am. But sometimes. now I have no position. But the general outlook on cryptocurrency is long, short, wide. Uh, what is the advice? Because youngsters in India are flocking to cryptocurrency. You and I, we don't know what the value will be of cryptos. Not because, say, Bitcoin is a bad idea. I think the uh, fundamental idea, you have something that is like money, but the supply is limited in the case of Bitcoins to something like 22 million units. Okay? So that is a good idea. But the issue is we have now thousands of Bitcoins outstanding. And the governments will also issue eventually cryptocurrencies. And the, whether Miss Yellen and Mr. Powell issue paper money or cryptos, <laughs> they will print, you understand? Yeah. So uh, what the value 
say we have a Picasso, but we also have a Van Gogh and we have Renoir and Velasquez and so, so many different artists. Yeah. So there is for Picassos, there's not just a competition from Picassos, but there is the competition from new artists that come up every day that paint in India and they paint in China and they paint everywhere in the world. So the supply of art is increasing. It's not the supply of Picassos or, or Bitcoins that is increasing, but the competing supply, the I'm alternatives. Sure. Yeah. So it's like if, if you, in India, you eat rice, okay? But in theory, you can also eat maize or other staple items. So when the price of rice goes up a lot, you could eat something different. When the price of uh, chicken goes up a lot, you can eat mutton and so forth. So there's a substitution impact. And in the case of cryptos, we don't know how big this impact will be. But I believe that uh, Bitcoins will be kind of the standard. Okay. It's like we have plugs or USB ports, okay? The USB port, the, the plug. Worldwide, this is a standard. You know, a computer made in India has the same USB port as a computer made in China or in Taiwan or in Brazil, anywhere in the world. And the electricity plug in most countries is not always the same, but it's similar. So I think that Bitcoins is kind of a, will be a standard. And uh, if you want to own cryptos, not as a speculator, it's like I own gold, not as a speculator, but as a store of value. And secondly, if you wear a nice gold ring or nice gold earrings or a nice gold chain, you look even more beautiful than you look now. Yes. So that's a reason also why gold throughout uh, centuries, throughout the millennials, uh, millenniums uh, has kept some value because it's a piece of jewelry. Right, yeah. With a limited supply. Good point, Mark. You know, you can have a lot of Bitcoins in your bank account when you go to a disco or you go to a restaurant, nobody sees these Bitcoins. You're right. So while there is value when Bitcoin may become standard, uh, speculation on that is not recommended, but the outlook, of course, uh, Mark, uh, you do think is optimistic. Always great talking to you. Talk to us so rarely that it's always a pleasure to get your perspective. Uh, I know we started with, say, 15 minutes, but I think we've gone way beyond that today. But okay. thank you very much. You have a pleasure. <laughs> no. But I want to add one more word about Bitcoins. It was said that Bitcoins facilitated crime and so forth because you could never trace it. Right. But the US government managed to get uh, the money that was stolen by hackers, blackmailed by hackers from this pipeline. They managed to get it back. So, so the argument, you know, the argument against gold and silver was always, well, if I travel from here to there, nobody sees my Bitcoins. But if you travel through custom in India with five kilos of gold, and especially if you arrive in the US, they will arrest you as a smuggler and as a yeah. money uh, launderer. Yeah. So th this is an issue is not clearly to be answered, but I personally, I prefer to hold physical gold. Okay. And for the more speculative part, I own some gold and silver shares. Wow. So and the cheapest, the cheapest is a platinum. Okay, so in that order, platinum, silver, and of course, gold top on that list. Correct. 
Right. Thank you very much, Mark. You have You're a great welcome. Day. <laughs> See you soon again. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.